All right. Well, thank you. Um, and thanks for letting me uh, present today. And thanks for joining. Um, so I'm going to uh, uh, talk about something that's actually near and dear to my heart. Um, we have a, a variety of clients that are in the space and um, some really good case studies here. So I figure let's talk about what um, a lot of companies are doing right now to engage uh, call center representatives um, who are really the face of the uh, company and making sure that they are prepared to engage with consumers and uh, make, make, uh, make, make the company proud, certainly in the way that they represent. So, um, you know, just a little bit more about myself for those who don't know me. Um, I am a product of the 1970s. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see me and my mom. And, um, uh, you know, I grew up certainly with the video game industry. And so I, uh, you know, er early in my career, went over to Atari and uh, was uh, director of marketing there and left um, almost now 20 years ago to start uh, the game agency and uh, joined ELB a few years ago. And I, I run creative now for ELB and all of our initiatives. Um, but it's a it's a fun it's a fun topic, um, games, and it's a great medium, certainly to engage learners. Uh, and we'll talk a lot today about why. Um, you know, one of the things that I think about when I think about what makes effective training overall um, are, are these three items, making sure that the training is a motivational experience, obviously making sure that it's memorable, uh, the content is going to stick, and making sure that you can measure it. And the really neat thing about games is, is that games allow you to do all three of these things. Um, obviously, it... it um, pulls upon both our intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through examples of those. Um, as a result, uh, it really has us leaning in to the content uh, and it is a lot more memorable. Um, uh, and, and there's so much data. There's so much data that comes with gameplay, uh, you know, from what people know to how they perform to their personas, uh, knowledge gaps. There's, there's a lot of stuff and we'll go through that as well. So, um, so, you know, one of the things that I, I want to have everyone here think about when you think about games is think about all the different venues that you can use games, right? So many of us think about games as a component of our e-learning. Um, you know, games certainly fit really nicely into any courseware. So whether you're building courses in Lectora or Captivate or Storyline or PowerPoint or just about anything, you can layer games in there as a component, certainly to act as a knowledge check, um, as a reinforcement point, as an assessment option. But beyond just e-learning, you certainly can use it for uh, instructional-led training. You can use it for virtual instructional-led training. You can use it for events. Um, you can bring people certainly to uh, to to you know co to compete and to collaborate uh, in in great volume. And so games really have the um, ability not only to accomplish all those things I said in the last slide, but really to pick up the energy and get people excited about the content. Um, and once you start to introduce competition and collaboration, it creates a whole uh, another dimension to your training. So um, one of the things I'd like to start off with, of course, I'm not really starting off because we're at slide five or so, um, but as I'd like to bring you through an example, and I'm going to throw this on mute, um, of what teleperformance is doing in the gaming space. So for those of you who are not familiar with teleperformance, they about 400 plus thousand um, uh, folks around the globe. They have some of the largest call centers, um, it really almost on every single continent. Um, and you know, one of the neat things that they've done is they've really adopted gaming in a meaningful way. Um, and that's in their e-learning, um, but that's also in their buildings and they've created these game zones um, I believe they have three or four of them around uh, the world, um, you know, to, to really introduce uh, content, training content, but other type of content to uh, make gaming part of their uh, culture. And, um, you know, I think that that's, that's, you know, this is potentially all the way at one extreme, but it's a way of making people feel excited about coming to work, excited about the content, um, competitive, collaborative, um, really engaging. So you can see how you can take it to an extreme. And quite honestly, once you see the data that I'll be presenting in, uh, later on this presentation, you'll see why they've gone this far. So um, we'll keep going and I can uh, you know, share this out, by the way, uh, this, this video, which has a lot more explanations available publicly, if you wanna see it, or I can send you a link. Um, 
You know, Abraham, uh, sorry, Ben Franklin said, uh, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. And I and quite honestly, games truly involve learners in a way that almost no other medium does. They require you to lean in. They require you to, to make choices. They require you to uh, uh, analyze the decisions you've made, um, potentially course correct as a result. Um, there are lots of different types of games and the 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 really neat things about gaming overall is especially as you get higher and higher up the blooms, um, you know, hierarchy, um, they require you to really think about things, try things, simulate things. Um, and as a result, you're going to learn. So um, I also want to just kind of talk about games, you know, before we get into some details, I want to get you talk about games in the context of other forms of training, right? So Obviously, a lot of what we focus at ELB is e-learning, um, which uh, it can be very uh, effective. Instructional-led training can be very effective. Game-based training, which also can be very effective. Um, but I, I, um, I'm a big uh, proponent of game-based training because if you think about the uh, the learning metrics that are on the left-hand side, it really scores um, extraordinarily high on uh, making sure that the content is application-based. Um, ultimately that, um, that the people are become more proficient, uh, with, with the content that they're more confident with the content that they, they, uh, content rather they, um, that they retain it, uh, on a much deeper level, um, that they're able to apply, uh, that post-training, uh, that they remain engaged. And so overall, when you think about, uh, you know, the, the cost to do so, um, there are so many cost efficient ways of building out games that the ROI is significant uh, in comparison to many other forms of training. So I think this is a good um, uh, slide to kind of think about at least that in context to other modalities you might be using uh, in, in your training overall. Um, and then when we think also about who's out there that we're training, uh, I, I often come back to this uh, slide and thinking about what is our uh, demographic, right? And interestingly enough, uh, the gamer demographic and the U.S. workforce demographic align fairly well. Um, and by the way, it's not too dissimilar worldwide as well. So, um, you know, the, the neat thing is, is that there are lots of people playing games out there. And this chart, I think, does a really good job of explaining who. So if you kind of break down the five generations that are in the workplace, uh, you know, that very first column, uh, sorry, row rather, is I play once to several times a day. Well, it's pretty high across the board. I play um, several times a week. Once again, um, you know, uh, pretty decent. So, um, just wanted to kind of give you give you a sense of you know how how what the level of engagement is across the board. Let's stop for one second and talk about games versus gamification because this is a, a these two terms come up a lot, and um, I think that sometimes potentially people use them uh, incorrectly. So I wanted to just quickly define the difference between the two. Games is a structure of play with challenge that has a win state usually undertaken for entertainment or for fun. So we have lots of games on our phones or our consoles or our computers, right? Gamification, on the other hand, is taking some of the elements of gameplay. So the goals and the rules, the interactions, the points, badges, leaderboards, rewards, and applying it to your everyday activities. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how this is being done really effectively within the customer service world. Um, some of it uh, in the day-to-day -day applications, some of it in the training. Um, but you know, I think that for the context of this talk, we should be thinking about both of these, uh, not only how to use games, but how to use gamification um, as part of your training uh, philosophy. So, okay, and why? why? Why games as part of that philosophy? Ultimately, I truly believe, and, and data shows, that games make the training stick a lot more, right? The training content is meaty, it's important, uh, the gameplay is yummy, uh, and it's, it has people coming back over and over again and engaging with it and enjoying it more, right? And so if you can marry those two, gosh, that is success in my mind, right? Let's think about a little bit about also um, wh what is happening when we're when we're when we're training people right with games. Um, you know, let's start at the top, right? We're, we're we have this mental involvement. We're motivating them certainly. There's a cognitive balance where we have them engaging with the content on a pretty deep level. Um, there's ongoing practice, right? Um, there's regular feedback, and we certainly know that um, many generations in our workforce today want feedback. Um, and then there's the the memory builders component, right? So there's the emotional um, 
uh, strings that we're pulling, right? There's the space repetition, um, which we know that as long as you're reinforcing any of your content in any format, it's going to stick better. There's storytelling and storytelling is truly key, especially when we're thinking about customer service training, soft skill training. We wanna make sure that they can really put themselves in the role in a safe environment uh, and try something out and see what the repercussions of those, uh, those actions are. And when you combine all these, the ability to retrieve that information in day-to-day -day work is significantly higher. So, you know, these are all really important components when we're thinking about why we use game-based training uh, for, you know, for, for, as, a, as a primary modality, um, or at least to augment our existing uh, uh, training overall. Um, okay. I, you know, one of the things that I, I always um, want to do is paint the picture that there are tons and tons and tons of uh, relevant tools to think about when it comes to training. And so I, I think that this chart does a really good job of um, starting to think about uh, not only what you might use games for and, um, uh, and then also the ease to build them in, but let's just start at the very bottom, right? Um, you know, we find that probably 50% of the games that our clients want are, are quite honestly simple trivia games, right? So, you know, there are tools like QStream, Kahoot, Trivi, um, that that accomplish that, and that's really all they focus on. But um, they're they're good tools for for accomplishing that, right? Then there's ga game templates. So if, you know anyone here knows the the origin of um, ELB uh, when ELB was E Learning Brothers. You know that's really where everything started, building out these templates that um, could be you know built in in minutes and uh, could really plug nicely into any rapid authoring. Um, there's branching story uh, tools like branch track or rehearsal. Um, and, you know, that that's certainly as we think about uh, probably a lot of what we're doing in uh, customer service training, soft skill training, that's really critical, right? It's um, going through different scenarios, um, trying out different uh, uh, voices, you know, trying out different messages, seeing how they resonate with the uh, characters that you're talking to, right? Then we can obviously build a lot in um, rapid authoring tools. So Articulate, Captivate, Lectora. Um, and you know, I think that uh, what's nice about those is that they're incredibly versatile. Um, the challenge with those is um, you're almost starting with a blank ca canvas, right? So um, it normally takes a little bit more time to build something uh, there, uh, but uh, you know, it, it can, it can uh, do anything you want. Um, we graduate up to the the 2D game engines, and so uh, you know, looking at uh, the Training Arcade, which is a, a e learning brothers product or sorry ELB product, um, and Construct Three, both of these are 2D engines. Um, we'll show you some stuff in the Training Arcade in particular today. Uh, um, but what's nice about these both these products is that you can build games relatively easily, um, and they're fairly versatile. In the 3D game engine space, Scenario VR, which also happens to the ELB product, um, allows you to start to build out games for um, virtual reality, for 3D environments, um, and uh, it's super exciting stuff that you can build there. The last is, and this is where um, you know we see only those who are uh, have have deep um, benches of talent uh, uh, in their in their uh, L and D uh, departments and uh, have the time and and energy. Um, you can build lots of stuff with custom programming using uh, Level X or Unity or Unreal Engine, um, and the the quality of the graphics can be off the charts. Certainly uh, along the lines of some of the things that we play on our consoles today. Um, and certainly the uh, versatility of what you can play also can be quite um, uh, interesting as well. So here's a variety of tools. I'm happy at any time uh, to, to talk about these either during Q&A today or at a later point if anyone has questions. Um, when we think about our learner, uh, regardless of what mechanic we're using, I think it's important to step back and say, what is going to motivate them, right? So you know, we often talk about these four um, uh, personas, right? Your achievers who are really just want to become really good at what they're doing. They want to master skills. Your explorers who want to solve problems. They want to discover new things. Your socializers who want to feel useful. They want to be praised, recognized, on leaderboards, that type of stuff. And then your fighters, those who want to win. They want to beat everybody no matter what. And, uh, and that's just that. 
And I think that if, as we're thinking about using gameplay, we want to make sure that we're building out content that is going to help our learners, regardless of which of these four quadrants they fit into, um, really get engaged with the content, right? Really get excited by it. Um, really want to continue to stick with it or come back and play it over and over again for, for a variety of reasons. Um, I also think it's important to think about what we're trying to uh, accomplish here, right? It's not just who we're reaching, um, but what is our performance objective? What are the be desired behaviors that we want our learners to do? So here's a, um, a revised Bloom's taxonomy uh, chart, right? And I think it's important to kind of use this as their base. Um, so, you know, whether it's about driving knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, uh, synthesis, uh, or evaluation, I think that ultimately uh, those headers and certainly a lot of the tasks underneath are all critical. And in most cases, it's not going to be we want to accomplish one of these, it's we want to accomplish a combination of these. Uh, so thinking about what games will help you do that. And so, uh, you know, this happens to be a mapping of the training arcade games that we have against the Bloom's taxonomy. So I think that's a good starting point. But once again, as we showed several slides back, the training arcade happens to be one of probably 20 tools out there. So as we think about your overall curriculum strategy and your performance objectives, I would imagine that you would want to uh, leverage a variety of game-based tools to accomplish that. Um, the other thing to think about is um, how you can measure um, the the success of of your uh, gaming strategy, right? So thinking about you know whether we want to measure retention, we're obviously truly uh, critical, right? Thinking about skills development um, and and the application of the content uh, um, afterwards, right? Thinking about how uh, people's decision processing uh, is, or the choices people make, their tendencies, their risk tolerance, um, their accuracy, their effectiveness. All these things are probably truly critical. And what I imagine that you would do, as we often do, is really design what are your KPIs up front and make sure that you um, are able to track against those KPIs and see where people are successful, right? Um, the, the reality is with games or gamification, um, the, it, what we're really leveraging here is uh, uh, the release of dopamine, right? Um, uh, the release of dopamine in our brains, and it's going to reinforce our desire to do something over and over and over again. And that's why people come back and they play games again and again and again. And so that's truly exciting because um, it gives us an opportunity to uh, really have someone master that skill um, digest that content over and over again until they really um, are able to take that knowledge and bring it to the field. Uh, and that's what's most important. Um, you know, when we talk about gamification, uh, as I mentioned you know, a few minutes ago, gamification really uh, finds itself in a lot of the tools that we're, we're using in the customer service world, right? So, you know, we're, we're tracking a lot of stuff in the day-to-day um, from ticket volume to handling time, closure rate, ticket uh, backlog, abandonment rate, you know, replies per resolution, you know, rates of answered calls, so on and so forth. And and what's really neat is is that you're seeing in our day to day world gamification being used to um, incentive, well, one to provide real time feedback to our learners, and two to incentivize them to um, you know up their game no pun intended, and perform at, at, the, at their peak. So, um, you know, this is, we're seeing this naturally happening in a lot of the software that uh, our folks are using, um, you know, in their day-to-day -day jobs. And then you can take it a step further and you can take that same concept of gamification, right? Um, uh, points and badges and leaderboards and potentially prizes, certainly lots of analytics, and then you can add in training to that as well, right? And think about how do I uh, build these little missions where I say, look, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, and here are the points associated with that, or here are your learning journeys. I want you to play solo or head to head with others or as teams. And I want to show you just really briefly um, how Arcades works in that front, um, because I think that this might be something uh, to consider. And we uh, will talk about how some of the customer service companies that we work with are actively using this platform. Hello, and welcome to our case, our new next-gen gamification solution that can be added to any subscription to the training arcade. 
While the training arcade is a factory in which you can build highly engaging training games that can be deployed anywhere, arcades is a hub for games built in the training arcade or elsewhere, as well as videos, PDFs, SCORM packages, and activities. Arcades goes beyond housing content. It motivates learners with competitive and collaborative campaigns that foster employees' connection and community. Let's dive into some of the main features available in arcades. Each player gets their own personal login and profile and is encouraged to choose or create an avatar that represents them. At any time, players can see what level they're currently on, which games they have yet to play or unlock, where they rank on the leaderboards compared to teammates, and so much more. Every game, video, PDF, SCORM package, or activity that a learner engages with earns them experience points, which drives their overall global leaderboard score. A player's level is also driven by experience points. As their level increases, players can claim real-world level-based prizes. The prizes, prize level, icon displayed, and optional prize limit are all easily customizable by the arcade's admin. Admins also have the option to bundle their players' activities into journeys. A journey is a way to organize your activities into stages, allowing players to earn experience points along the way. Journeys allow clients to create educational and training progressions, introduce new materials, and guide users to external resources and evaluations through the use of games, videos, PDFs, and URL links. Games in the arcade can be played using three different modes. Solo play, in which learners compete with themselves to achieve a personal best score. Head-to-head -head play, where learners challenge their peers to battles using a multiplayer feature. Pick a game, select an opponent, and compete. And team play, where individual teammate scores tie together and learners encourage one another to help top the leaderboard score. As players rack up experience points, they unlock badges and achievements, which can help redeem real-world prizes. Subscribers can quickly turn their solitary, static training content into a fun multiplayer experience with arcades. Okay, so, you know, I think then the last um, session, um, uh, Katie Kinsella and um, our friends over at TELUS talked a little bit about how they're using uh, you know, game-based training overall, and certainly they're they're um, uh, avid users of this. But we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, another partner of ours, Teleperformance. Um, and Teleperformance uh, is uh, does an amazing job um, of building out games, and has been for the last um, uh, you know five six years. Uh, and and not just in the training arcade, they use a variety of topics and the uh, products rather. And the reason they do is because they really subscribe to um, reinforcement, um, trying to really um, battle that forgetting curve, right? They are reinforcing content over and over and over again. And beyond that, they are really looking at not only what the learner knows, but what their trainer is uh, doing and how effective their actual trainer is. Um, so it's super uh, data rich, the, their, their, um, their actions on their side. Um, I'm going to, before I get to that, I want to just kind of show, uh, you know, one other uh, uh, partner of ours. So Supercell, this is a good example of building, uh, you know, games right into rapid authoring courses. So this this took um, Storyline, built out a game in Storyline using some of their characters for their customer service um, representatives to understand how to um, uh, deal with objection handling um, and made it really fun. Uh, and this was quite honestly, it performed quite well. The, the difference between this and what I'm about to show you is with Teleperformance, um, they're using uh, a variety of game uh, mechanics within the train arcade. They're using uh, Minecraft. They're building custom games. And I want to go over some of the statistics of what uh, we're seeing with them. Amazing stuff, right? So 90% of their new hires um, represent themselves as gamers. So um, probably consistent with most of our organizations. Uh, you know, They've been using the training arcade for a few years now. Um, they've built 29,000 games. So, I mean, the numbers are off the charts, uh, their, their dedication to using games as a, a solution. They've had 6 million games played, uh, and the average gameplay is about 30 minutes uh, long. So 
Now, I'll tell you, this 30 minutes is actually significantly longer than um, most of our train arcade games. So I believe that this data takes into account um, how they're using Minecraft and how they're using their custom games as well. Um, but the average person is playing, uh, you know, game sessions about eight times. So this we're seeing really clearly is the repetitive nature of gameplay um, is going to have someone coming in uh, for any of those you know, motivations that we talked about earlier, whether it's about mastering content or exploring new information or um, trying to be social with uh, others or just trying to win, right? Um, the games that they happen to use a lot are trivia and scram uh, scramble and jump. Um, but here are some of the metrics of the success that they've seen, right? So they've seen a 21% increase in knowledge between you know, the first and third session. So um, they're seeing a 12% reduction in handling time. They're seeing a, eight, a little over 8% 8 uh, improvement in first call resolution. Um, and they're seeing customer satisfaction scores go from 4 to 4.4. So you know, quite honestly, the ROI is there, which is fantastic to see um, the, the, the results very quickly based off of gameplay as a, a, a key to their training. Um, when we think about game-based training overall, it's going to accomplish a number of things, right? But as we talked about, we're going to have a much more engaged learner. You're going to have um, significantly more um, increased attention because uh, I often say this when we're where we're driving. Um, sometimes we text, which none of us should do, but it's pretty hard to drive and play a game at the same time. That level of attention that's required to play a game is significant. And, uh, you know, it, quite honestly, when you have a learner's attention in a game, you're going to be able to keep it at a much higher level than most other modalities. Um, they're going to stay focused, right? Um, and as they're getting uh, further and further into the game, their confidence is going to improve, right? Because we see that people are trying things, they're learning from them, they're um, feeling successful because as they continue to try, they get better and better. Um, there, that knowledge is being reinforced, which is really critical. Um, and, and we're also seeing as, as a result of it uh, being reinforced and them changing what they're doing, their behavior not only in the game, but outside the game is changing as well. Um, they're becoming better performers, right? And they are driving more revenue, right? So whether that is they're cross-selling or they're upselling or they're retaining clients or whatever they're doing, they're um, really uh, acting as that front line and, and driving more revenue for your organization. Um, games are like a kiss. They're interesting to read about, but they're way more interesting to do. And that's why people come back over and over again, right? So when you're doing either, people tend to repeat both them, both experiences. And that is without a doubt, something that we see with gameplay. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I, I'd love to open up for questions. Um, happy to kind of dig in and maybe talk through some examples together, but hopefully that's a good foundation for starting. All right, thank you so much, Stephen. We, let's see, I'll start with this question. Can you uh, embed the training arcade games into courses that you're building in an authoring tool? Yes, so with the training arcade, yes, you can. Um, super simple. Um, and actually, let, let me just talk about when you're um, building a game, you would do that in the form of um, uh, a web object. You can put it right into any um, authoring tools, Storyline, Captivate, Lectora, so on and so forth, even into PowerPoint. Um, but you can also, um, you know, do it as a um, as a uh, embed code, um, or you can do it as a, as a SCORM package or XAPI package. So depending on where you want it to go, the idea with um, the training arcade games is you build them and you can put them wherever you want. So, but yes, they're meant to sit right in courses if that's the desired experience and uh, feel like a continuous experience. So you're not coming um, out of your course and playing a game and then come back in. So you could also put them in an LMS, right? You can put them right in LMS and you would do that as a um, SCORM package or an XAPI package. Yep, exactly. Okay. And then what about translations or other languages? We've had a lot of attendees on from different countries. Can they still use the training arcade? Yeah, so for the training arcade in particular, um, it's available in 20 languages. Um, and you can publish it out as one or, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever you want, anywhere in between. Um, and so the way you would do that is you would um, create the game. Uh, you would then, uh, you can either translate it right in um, the uh, Train Arcade authoring tool, or you can export a CSV file, um, have your localization team fill that out, upload it in. And what would happen on the 
um, learner experiences, they'd come to the game in the default language, uh, whatever you choose that default language to be. Um, the very first thing you would see is a drop down that says, choose your language. You choose a language and then everything from the questions and the answers would shift automatically to um, the uh, to, to the language of their choice. Okay, that's very cool. And then another question, are all of these games just for like solo play, asynchronous learning, or can you do any of them live with multiple players? No, it's a great question. So um, uh, there are a handful of our games, um, in particular our trivia game and our Jeopardy game that are designed with a virtual instructor um, facilitator um, where you can you know, run those uh either in a open classroom or uh, on Zoom or any other um, web-based format. Uh, and, and then all of our games can play as single player. Um, some can be played uh, beyond those two, uh, you know, uh, as, as a multiplayer games. Um, also within arcades, um, you know, regardless of the game, you can come in and you can play a game on your own. You can play it as part of a team, if you set it up that way, or you can play it um, head to head against other players. And so that's a really important, I'm glad someone asked that because that's an important component when you think about gameplay overall, it's really about not just um, doing the best that you can, it's about doing the best that you can or that, you know, contributing to a team or competing with others. It depends on what the objective is of that session, right? So you want to make sure that whatever tools you're using, whether it's a training arcade or something else, that it's accommodating uh, that, that uh, versatility. Um, speaking of um, accommodating, are the games in the training arcade accessible are, um, for those with like cognitive motor vision and hearing disabilities? What are the ways that you can accommodate different learners with our games? It's a, it's a great question. Um, certainly, uh, 508 compliance is really tough with games. Um, and I should say, it's tougher with some games than others. So for instance, in our Endless Jumper, which is you know more of a, um, a action pack game, or our the hardest game in my opinion, the, the hardest game in step. I am terrible at jump. Um, but that's just that's a that's a you problem, not not everyone I know. else. I know. But, um, but you know, in games like that, that's um, th that it, that it has certainly a lot more motion, a lot more color, a lot more um, um, special effects. That's really hard to make um, five hundred eight compliant. However. Um, you know, we've uh, done certain things, I believe, in our trivia game, in our Jeopardy game, um, maybe one or two others to uh, accommodate some of the 508 compliant requirements. Um, uh, the, the, the reality is, is that with, um, with CAG, um, you know, that there are uh, something like, you know, 50, 60 requirements. And I think that we check off the vast majority of them, but I don't believe we check up all of them. So, um, I think it depends on how um, strict you want to be. And we've tried to take a few to, and go as far as we can and still make it a good learner experience and a good game experience. Absolutely. And all right, so we, we've got this question a few times today. Can you do a, a quick explanation of the training arcade versus arcades? Okay, yes, I can. Yeah. Um, and I will start by apologizing because like, Five years ago, I was part of this bad naming um, decision. So, oh, so Stephen's fault. It's my she fault, and I, I'll take full her. responsibility. I'll take partial responsibility. Uh -huh. All right. So, the training arcade. The training arcade is a game authoring tool. So, think about you know you go into any other authoring tool and you're creating the content. In this case, you're 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 basically creating the game. I'm going to create a Jeopardy game or a trivia game or a, a Wheel of Fortune game or whatever. Um, you go into the back end and you're going to quickly determine certain things like what's the name of the game? What are some of the rule sets? How much time do I want to give people? Um, you know, do I want to have leaderboards on? All that type of stuff. Then you plug in all the questions and you figure out how you want to publish it out, figure out all the localizations. That's that's a game builder. That's the training arcade. Arcades, and it's worth mentioning the fact that they leverage the same technology. So it's one stack, but arcades is the gamification layer that we're talking about. So I showed that video towards the end of my presentation. And that is more about um, taking not only the games you've built, but the training you've built, other type of training you've built, um, other type of tasks you want people to do, um, and really gamifying the whole thing, giving people points and badges and leaderboards for engaging with any of your content 
in um, any order that you want, having prerequisites set up, having team challenges, having people working collaboratively, um, so on and so forth. So there's one as a game builder and one as a gamification platform utilizing the same tech stack, if you will. Hopefully that's helpful. And if it's not, I would honestly say the, the best option to understand it is go on our website. I just posted two links, one for the training arcade, one for arcades. And if that doesn't help, schedule a demo because then you can have one of our reps show each tool on the screen, walk through exactly what it is. Because yeah, Stephen, you just did a bad job naming things. Fair enough, fair enough. I'll take responsibility. All right, um, we do have a couple more questions. Do you ever assess your users before just jumping straight into the training, like finding out how they learn best, or do you um, build it based more around the fighter, socializer, achiever, explorer model that you showed? Well, so uh, the answer is I don't look at uh, personally, and maybe some organizations do differently. I don't personally look at a workforce and say, Hey, Stephanie is quite the fighter and Stephen's quite the socializer, right? Um, and by the way, she is, she's, she's, okay. um, but I, no, I don't do that, right? But I, uh, but I do look at our games and try to, and as we design games, try to think about, is this going to take into account those four personas, right? And I think that's really important is to make sure that any game design really does uh, accommodate that. Um you know, Stephanie, um, I know this wasn't the question, but I want to actually mention this because you, you triggered a thought here. One of the things that I encourage people to use games for um, uh, is when you think about the training that you're going to do, especially um, if you're doing a lot of instructional-led training, I would think about using games not only in that instructional-led environment, but thinking about games as a pre- and a post-tool um, as well, right? So while Stephanie was talking about, do you assess your learners to understand where do they fall into a game and how would you utilize them? Think about utilizing games in a different assessment way, utilizing that that gameplay, sending it out to your workforce of 50, 100, 1,000 people before they're going to do their um, instructional-led training. Um, understand where their level of knowledge is and tailor your instructional-led training to, uh, to accommodate where people are coming from, right? You're going to be able to see very quickly, you know, uh, with very little effort on your learner's part, where there are knowledge gaps, where there are performance gaps, where there's um, you know persona uh, uh, items that you want to flag, to 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 adjust your learning to make sure that your instructional led training is as effective as possible, or even your e-learning is as effective as possible, and you can then use the games on a later date as um, that reinforcement tool. So we've kind of showed that chart about the um, forgetting curve. You want to be you you want to be reiterating your content over and over again. It doesn't need to be thirty minutes. It could be three minutes. Right, but take the things that are most important and make sure that you're reinforcing that in the form of gameplay, having people play through stuff, um, and seeing where they are. And you can uh, build new games all the time. These games are super simple to build. Um, they take about thirty minutes, and quite honestly, they're incredibly effective. Fantastic answer. Uh, do we offer a VPAT for each of the games? Uh, sorry, one more time. Do we offer what? Uh, VPAT, I know we have one for Lectora, the VPAT, it's about the accessibility. I don't know if we... I don't know the answer um, to that, Stephanie. We, we may. Um, so. Erica, I will look into this for you. You stumped Stephen, so gold medal for you. We do, all right, so we did have a comment in the chat wondering if we have any pre-made Minecraft games. We don't have a pre-made one, but I know we did create a custom one with a Minecraft theme, right, Stephen? Yeah, so we've worked on Minecraft um, for from, for some custom clients. Um, it's a great tool, depending on what you're trying to do, right? Um, it's certainly great for simulations. It's great for team building. It's great for um, creating very custom worlds. And quite honestly, depending on how far you want to go, you can do it sometimes um, with some cost savings as a result. Their environment's fantastic, um, but we don't have one that's you know ready to go and open to, to, to license. Um.